And a lot of the stuff that proteins interact with is other proteins. Uh, this is just an overview of, uh, I'm not going to go into any detail here, uh, but this is just an overview of like certain different categories of prediction methods for, um, for predicting protein interactions. Um, there's a very old method that's called mirror tree that basically looks at the, the correlated evolution of, uh, of protein families. And then it says, well, if they if their evolutionary trees correlate, that means they probably uh, evolved under very similar uh, uh, um, selection pressure throughout the whatever evolutionary history is captured, and that probably means that they are related in function, and that might mean that they are actually interacting. The very indirect evidence uh, for protein interaction, so it doesn't have a very high uh, accuracy uh, in, in terms of sensitivity. But uh, you can do it basically for any protein family, because if you have 20, 30, 40 uh, proteins, you can make a tree, you can correlate it with other trees. Um, slightly more specific is you, the use of uh, correlated uh, mutation analysis, what Sana already explained to you, uh, which is quite tedious to do between proteins, because you actually have to make um, what I would call a correlated alignment. You need uh, both proteins from the same species in both alignments, and because otherwise you can't correlate a column of amino acids from one protein <coughs> to a column of amino acids from, from the other protein. But that works. If you if you can get that data and you have enough of it, that works. Um, protein protein docking. I, um, there's a bit, a little bit of docking in the in the book, but not too much uh, either. Uh, there's um, Dan Geert has a good course on protein docking. Uh, Normal protein protein docking, small uh, protein docking. But the principles are very very similar. Uh, this is this is sequence based, right? So this is structure based. It's compared to these methods, is very slow, um, and it doesn't. It's not very accurate. And um, if you want to have more accuracy and you can afford going even slower, you can use MD simulations. Basically, uh, exactly what you're doing in your protein. Right? You, you really simulate the unbinding process uh, of the two proteins, and you, you, you just calculate the physical uh, forces involved and um, integrate the uh, free energy from that. Okay. Um, for this, you need the structure of the proteins. For this, you actually need the structure of the complex. Right, so if you if you only have the structure of the proteins, you could first do docking and then the simulations, but then it's going to be difficult. Okay. Um, I need to decide what to do with the rest of my time. Our time, I should say. Uh, I'm going to do all this. Uh, I guess so. Okay. So... Um, <coughs> There's more to proteins than just interacting with other proteins. Uh, they also interact with small molecules. And uh, so a lot of protein function also has to do with metabolic processes. And if you zoom out, then it looks a little bit like this. Although this is the status of 30 years ago or so. Uh, it's much bigger than that. There's the uh, citric acid cycle somewhere in, 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 over here. Glycolysis somewhere over here, if I remember correctly. Fatty acid synthesis over here. Minor acid synthesis, I think, is at the bottom right. It could be over here. So I don't know. Anyway. Um, I 
I'm going to just repeat what Jaap always says, is please do remember that all these networks are figments of our imagination. If you zoom in to a, pro to a cell, you'll be able to zoom in to the level that you can see the individual proton molecules, you don't see interactions. Right? Not, uh, uh, like you, we don't, I don't see interactions between you guys be, by looking at you in the classroom. Like if I take a picture, yeah. But if I would know your Facebook profiles, trust me, I'm not going to go to <laughs> GPDR and all sorts of privacy. <laughs> but if you would overlay uh, data from from Facebook, LinkedIn, Tinder. Uh, yeah? Then you get different pictures on about interaction. But they're all just they all capture particular aspects of what evokes interactions between people. Yeah? That's the same for proteins. There are different ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it is this. Did I show you this picture before? Yeah. Yes. Mentals? Okay, so I actually found a higher resolution for it. So it's, it's much nicer now. Okay. Um, so, um, so this is what, if you like, protein interactions look like in, in the wild. Right? It, it's, it's a lot of proteins and there's a lot of interactions, but it's very hard. To, and actually, they don't have the interactions correct here. Right? So that's the thing that's missing. Uh, and I don't remember if they discussed this in any detail in the paper. Uh, what they have as input for this figure, because it's sort of an artist's rendering of this, it's a synaptic cloud, so it's a small piece of a neuron. Uh, and, and these vesicles are filled with uh, 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 neurotransmitters. They're, they're supposed to be released. There's one that's just fused with the membrane, releasing the neurotransmitters. Right? So this is an active bud. Um, but what they have is the different pro the proteins, uh, their quantity, and their approximate location. But they don't have all the interactions, except in some cases where, like, there's alpha beta tubulin dimer, or there's like uh, 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 an actin filament where we know these interactions. Right? But uh, there's a lot more interactions there that we're pretty sure are happening, but we don't know how, so they haven't put that in this data. I haven't been able to put that into this figure uh, in any detail. Right? So the interactions are sort of implied, but they're not explicit and they're not correct. And if you zoom in, it looks a bit like this, right? It looks like a, 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 like a, a, a knitting basket after the cat has had fun with it. Um, and uh, it, it, it also means that if you're talking, like in the, in the simulations for the practical, we have a very clean system. We have a box of water, quite small, unless you've mistaken nanometers for angstroms. Um, and two proteins, and that's it. Right? Well, actually, a couple of uh, ions, I think. I'm not sure. But it's quite, you, you can never get anything even remotely that pure in any experiment. Yeah? Not, not even in, not even uh, close to it. Uh, so this, but this is how biophysicists work, right? That they get a pure, and then they can study the system in isolation, and they can do useful experiments. So you get a, you get a, a lot of knowledge about a tiny bit of the whole system, and then you're assuming that when you put it into this mass, it still works the same way. And it might, it might not be, right? But then. Uh, you're not going to be able to do all that detailed calculation for each possible interaction. Because it's not just the interactions of proteins where we know that there's a function attached to this interaction, um, like alpha and beta uh, tubulin forming a dimer and then forming a, 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 a filament. Uh, but there are also all sort of spurious interactions happening. Some of them might and others might not have an effect on the proteins that are interacting. Um, and we don't really know very well how to differentiate between the spurious <coughs> interactions and the functional ones. Because we, for, for, for the main reason is that we can't really 
uh, we can't measure all of these interactions. We don't have. We can measure a lot of interactions. We can measure all of them. And if you don't have the full picture, then you can't you can't start doing the statistics to find out which are the ones that are actually associated with when when something happens. Right. So for sequences, for evolution, and so on, we can do that because we can do whole genome sequencing. We can look at all the rare and more, more frequent events and do correlations and do filtering and, and so on. And then you can start understanding what each of these mutations do if they do anything. Okay? And then you can start making the distinction between spurious mutations and functional mutations or impactful mutations. Um, we're not there yet with protein interactions. Okay, and the reason that I emphasize that is because if we don't know, we don't understand protein interactions, we don't have a clear picture of that, we have a hard time, we will have a hard time understanding protein function. So that's where we are at the moment. Maybe that also explains why these two chapters were uh, a bit hard to uh, understand. Okay, so uh, hard to write, sorry. I hope they're not hard to understand, but they were hard to write. Well, the previous versions were hard to understand. Okay. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, did I show you these as well in fundamentals? Citric acid cycle. Really? Oh, well. Oh. If you don't remember, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, so you know the citric acid cycle, right? Uh, central metabolism. There's uh, a stick coa coming in uh, at the top from the, uh, I hope they put it at the top here, uh, coming in from the black horses. Um, Inside the circle. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Can't be biochemists that drew this one. <laughs> um, it's always at the top. Yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, <coughs> driven by, by, by basically input from glycosis, but that's not the only way to drive it, and there's lots of things happening around it that I don't want to go into now. But this is like the source. And if you draw this in a different way, then it looks like it looks like this. Uh, so this is this is this octagon is the uh, is the, is the whole cycle. There's a couple of shortcuts, and this is the input from glycosis. Uh, this is actually already. <coughs> Two decades old, this work. Uh, so there's there's probably a lot more to be said about it right now, but this is just the to illustrate the concept. So here they've actually looked up all the homologs of the uh, enzymes involved in a couple of different organisms. And uh, so for yeast we have the complete cycle, for mycobacterium tuberculosis as well, uh, for E. coli as well. But then there's other uh, um, um, uh, uh, microorganisms which either do not have a complete citric acid cycle uh, or they have uh, we don't we, we can't we can't detect it right so the enzymes might be there so there's question marks in some places where uh, we suspect that the enzyme should be there because of what kind of conditions this this uh, uh, um, this bacterium grows in but we can't find a gene that's responsible for it. Right? Um, and some of them really don't have a citric acid cycle. And so in, in some cases, this is not uh, is not surprising because, and I, I'm not good, at, I'm not a microbiologist, uh, at least I'm not, not good enough a microbiologist to remember exactly what Pyrococcus hiricoshi actually grows in, whether it needs a complete citric acid cycle in those conditions, but uh, it doesn't have a complete. Okay, so um, if we want to, we, we can scale this up a little bit, and then um, I'm going to use these three papers, and I, you've seen at least one of those before in fundamentals. Uh, so they look at a, what they call a genome-reduced bacterium. Uh, so it's the um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, if I'm not mistaken, but there's two different ones that, that we're using, so I might... <coughs> If it's the other one, it will be on the slide. Um, and they've tried to do sort of whole uh, whole organism modeling uh, in the broadest sense on this uh, bacterium. 
three papers already a while ago, the, the date is in here, it's on the next slide. Uh, they looked at the uh, metabolism and regulation, they look, looked at the transcriptome, and they looked at the proteins. Uh, so quite extensive. And the, the goal, so this was a 10 year project worldwide, uh, hundreds of people involved. Uh, if you look into these papers, there's lots of associated papers with a lot of more detail about the methods and the data and, and so on. Um, at the end of these 10 years, they expected to be able to present a complete working model like a living model of the cell. Uh, why? Because it only has about 700 genes. And you can just, with 100 people in 10 years, you can just go through <coughs> each of the genes, one by one, find out what their function is, stitch it all together, and then it should work. Right? No. You couldn't do it. But as far as I know, but uh, uh, one of the guys involved, I uh, no. What is it? Oh no, sorry, I thought it was going to be a biosophia meeting. No, different guy. Anyway, um, well, I've, uh, I've heard Luis Serrano talk about this a couple of times uh, uh, um, uh, in the couple of the last, not, not the last few years, but before. Uh, and he always says, in his, I can't do the Spanish accent, but uh, he says, we haven't got a clue. We have no clue. There's so much that, that's happening that we don't know. Or stuff that we that's not happening that we don't understand why not. Um, I'll, I'll go go through a few highlights there. Um, um, no, I'm uh, sorry, I don't have the details here. Um, I have one detail. The but what I'm just let me just summarize. So they 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 are they, at the end they are left with about forty to fifty. Uh, biochemical functions where they can actually measure the product, so something <coughs> must be doing it, um, and they can't find a gene that does it. Yeah. Also, they have about 30 to 40 genes for which they, with, with all the techniques available, were not <coughs> able to find a function. Right? So you have geneless functions, you have functionless genes. You would think, okay, 40 by 40, you try all the combinations. They did, didn't work. So for some of them, they did, for many of them, they did the crystallography. They have the structure. You look at the structure. Doesn't look like anything we've seen before. We have no idea. Okay. Just don't know. Okay. Um, and yes, they also tried to, to isolate these proteins, put in the substrate for one of the unknown with the functions with unknown protein, see if it actually catalyzes it, and then it didn't. Otherwise, they would have solved the problem, right? So then it could be conditions, wrong pH, might need a cofactor, or another protein there. Or there's so many things that you need to take into that. So do we need some type of revolutionary change in the way we're handling this, or, or the incremental improvements eventually going to make it? That's a very good question. I, I hope the second, because that, that's what we're actually trying. Um, but it it does show, it, I mean, science is inherently a reductionist. I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to keep this philosophy part that I <laughs> contain. But, uh, and I think what we're seeing here is, is the limit to what you can solve with a reductionist approach. The reductionist basically means you break down your, your problem into small pieces, individual enzymes, individual genes, and then you try to build it up from there. The, the whole field of system biology is sort of trying to counterbalance that and trying to look at, at systems as a whole. But still, the data that you need to put in comes from reductionist experiments, <coughs> measuring the enzyme kinetics of a particular single enzyme and so on. And that doesn't always work. But we don't really have a good alternative. At least, I don't know of one. But if you do, please stop. If you write a grant together, and have a good chance. Of getting somewhere. Okay, uh, but this was sort of an approach. But this was sort of an attempt to get. I mean, they did get a lot of new new insights into how this bacteria work. But they also have a lot of open questions. And I, I have to make a caveat here. These papers, these papers were 2009, so it's almost 10 years ago. I haven't been keeping up with this, right? So. Uh, it might be that they now know a lot more about this material. Maybe they've solved all the remaining functions. Uh, 
I don't think so, because I'm pretty sure I would have uh, read it. If they One of the things that they that they saw, you know about operons, right? You know what operons do in prokaryotic uh, cells? Yeah? They're basically like uh, a set of genes with one regulatory unit. So if you turn one on, you turn the whole operon on. For example, uh, most bacteria have one operon for most of the its biology. It's never clean, but most of the ribosomal proteins are on one, even the like together with one of the uh, RNA subunits are on one operon. Makes sense because you can't make uh, a functional uh, ribosome if there's one part missing. Yeah? We've all had probably at some point to return a cupboard or something to IKEA because there's one part missing, doesn't work. Yeah? Uh, maybe you can fix it with duct tape. That's also what evolution does. That's how probably some of those genes end up in a different operon at, at some point. Right? Anyway, um, so an operon goes on or off as one unit. That's what everybody knows, right? Now, they've actually looked at transcript dynamics of a couple of genes on the same operon, and they had to coin a new term, which is called sub operon dynamics, because they can see... Oh, what you also expect is that genes at the end of the operon have a lower expression. Why? Because the polymerase will drop off the DNA at some point. Might not reach the end of the operon. That, that, that's what you expect. But you don't expect uh, the third gene to be expressed lower and the fourth gene to express, be expressed higher. There's no known, in 2009, there was no known mechanism to explain how the fourth gene could have a higher expression level than the third one. Just shouldn't be possible. Everybody knew that this was not possible, so nobody actually did the measurements. Maybe some people did, and then their supervisor said, nah, do it again, can't be right. Or the reviewer said for the paper, no, this must be wrong, reject. Yeah? Um, so this can't work, this can't be true, but it is. And it depends on conditions. So this is when it's different growth conditions, when it grows fast, it's called exponential phase. Stationary phase is when, uh, when basically the number of cells, the new number of cells is equal to the number of cells that die. Um, and you get different in this uh, difference here. And, and there's a another operon that also has these things, but there are a couple more. And so there must be a mechanism involving at least a few proteins that, uh, that makes this work. Okay. So this is, unknown, this is a function. So now we have a function with an unknown protein. Here, right? Okay. Um, one of the reasons that I end this course with this paper because of this image. This is one of the coolest images that I've seen so far. So this is an electro electron tomography image of this mycobacterium tu tuberculosis. Uh, it's, from the, uh, it's from the proteomics paper. And uh, they got the resolution so high that they can identify not individual proteins. That would have been like really, that would have been an old one. Uh, this should be, this should almost be, this should be close enough, but, um, so, uh, they can identify some of the larger, uh, protein complexes, like the pyruvate, pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, complex, I think it's in the citric acid cycle, or in the glycolysis, does anybody remember? Or, somewhere close by. Uh, the ribosome is also a big beast, and the RNA polymerase, so, that you can, and, and Groel, that's a protein folding chaperone. So these four ones, they can actually identify <coughs> this image. And you don't have to do um, uh, estimates based on titration or uh, mass spectrometry or anything else to estimate the number of complexes in your, uh, in your cell. You can count them. You can say there are 100 pyruvate hydrogenase complexes. There are 140 ribosomes, 300 polymerases, and 100 Goriels. Give or take a few. Because some blobs might actually be Goriel, but you can, oh well, it's a bit of malformed. And some of so you might, there might be a few that you've missed. Right? Um, so this is cool, right? This is cool. This is, this is, cellular, this is cell biology, right? 
Well, the, the only thing that I is that I find a shame is that you, they they haven't been able to resolve the DNA here. That would make this this picture even more beautiful because there's also, also the genome which is in there. Um, I first thought that this might have been the DNA, but this is actually it's this is uh, it's called the rod. It's it's a it's also a protein structure. It's the wedge with which this bacterium inserts itself in between the epithelial cells in the lung, because it's the tuberculosis bacterium. Uh, uh, it grows in the lungs. Um, but from this, it's only a small step to the atoms and the, uh, the molecules and the atoms that we have seen in the uh, in the course. So, uh, ah, there's the pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, over here, uh, where is the citric acid cycle here? I don't see it. Um, but it's not so much. So this is zooming out, right? This is where the complex is. And then if we zoom in. Oh, sorry. I, d I don't have the figure of the PACH. I have the ribosome. So this is the image of the ribosome that they had in their thermography. And this is what the what the ribosome looks like if you uh, if you pull up the uh, crystal structure of the ribosome. Um, so it, it's it's a really a tangle of stuff, uh, but if you zoom in, not too much it's, if you zoom in, it's only a few steps to the atoms, and this is the anti-carbon binding to your DNA template. Right? So it's a few small steps from this tomography figure of the whole cell to the atoms, where basically uh, the molecular biology is happening. Right? And this is protein function. Yeah, you want to see it again? So this is the whole ribosome, and we're zooming in, right? It's, it's a bit coarse figure. Uh, I made it with Rasmol, but it works. Right? So the, the, the here's you see the uh, the phosphate backbone uh, of the uh, anticolon over here. So the tRNA is there, and this is the RNA the template. Okay. The other thing that they have there is GROEL. And uh, I'll leave it, leave it out for a minute. It would be so nice if this works. Oh. Yeah, OK. So this is, the, oh, uh, if you want to look it up, one AOM. It's one of the few PDB codes I know uh, <coughs> of my head. That's the. Uh, PDB structure of the uh, one. Have a look. It's really awesome. It's uh, it's more than a million atoms. Okay. Um, so, so this is. So you might think that when you're when you're doing all the simulation work and you're looking at all this nitty gritty of the atoms and the helices and the protein structure that you're quite far removed from biology. And I'm, I'm try showing this to, to try and convince you that uh, they're really connected. You're really, not in all cases, but in many cases, you need the atomistic detail. You need to go and dig through the protein structure dynamics to be able to do something with protein function. Okay. The, we, oh, we have time Okay, so um, another example is this one where they, the, the paper title is Nothing to Sneeze At, a Dynamic and Integrative Computational Model of Influenza A Variant. So they've, they, they've simulated the whole, uh, the whole virus, um, actually using a, a coarse grain model, not, I, I'm not, I don't remember if they actually used the Martini model, I think they did. The same one that you're using in the in the in the practical. But in it, in a, in addition to having uh, pairs of proteins interacting, uh, they have it in uh, in the capsid uh, uh, lipid uh, vesicle that's uh, encapsulating the uh, the virus. Um, so it's um, I don't remember now. So the next slide. So they don't actually. Sorry, I uh, say capsid. It's the envelope. So they, I don't think they have the actual capsid inside, because that's why like the icosahedral protein um, 
captured. Uh, but they do have something inside that, it, in, that models the shape of it. Because there's limits to what you what they wanted to put into more. But what they uh, one of the things they looked at was the interaction between two particular proteins in the So here you see the lipid membrane. This is an integral uh, membrane protein. And these are two, uh, they're also membrane proteins, but they're sticking out of the membrane. And these two, um, um, I was going to say extracellulars, but external uh, domains, they are thought to interact. But they don't. people don't know exactly how strongly they interact. And here they looked at how uh, the strength of the interaction actually influences the dynamics of the shape of the whole vesicle. And they see something like this. Uh, oh, wait, this is over here. Uh, so they look at sphericity, so how, sp how spherical it is. And they look at here. You look at, so when they, so protein restraint here means that they've actually made a very strong interaction between these two uh, external domains. And then you see. Uh, uh, now I've lost my. There's there's two things they've done. I think I'm now mis I'm now getting things mixed up. Um, just they here they're looking at different lipids in the in the in the bilayer. Okay. Yes. So there are two. So this is uh, with a particular force is a particular lipid that they so they do it with and without, and protein restraint is where they uh, have the additional protein interaction. Um, and now, but I I'm sorry I forgot what the conclusion was that they exactly drew from this. Uh, here they they try to show that the distribution of the proteins across the uh, the outside is is quite different. Uh, here you see more patches, and here you see that it's more evenly spread. Uh, and here they look at the uh, the uh, overall distribution, protein-protein distance distribution uh, across the uh, different proteins in the uh, uh, in the um, vesicle, um, which depends on the interactions. That makes sense, but it also depends on which <coughs> lipid, the lipid composition of the of the bilayer. Okay. Sorry, I got a bit hazy on the details here. Um, the important thing is here that we can actually go from uh, atomistic simulation or near atomistic simulations, uh, cross uh, to to something that's really, let's say, biology, and it helps you understand some of the details of how how something as complex as a, or a from a biological point of view, it's the simplest thing you can think of. But it's still, from a molecular point of view, quite complex mechanism like a, a, a virus. Okay, uh, with that, we we have a first in this course of the <laughs> ending ahead of time. <laughs> um, are there any questions about the lecture material, about any of the other lectures, any other uh, of any of the other topics? No. Yeah. Oh, for the practical. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. So then we will maybe spend a few minutes on that. Yeah. So the. So what is your question precisely? Um, well, general. It's hard to look it up on Google and also in the paper. I don't really get what. It is. Okay. So, um, can I, I, I still would like to try and narrow down the, the main question first. So it's about the potential new force calculation and the umbrella sampling, right? Mm -hmm, yeah, but the, uh, the first question I asked what the difference is between umbrella sampling and force constraint. Yes. Uh, I get what umbrella sampling is because like very. Easy explain on the internet, and then when I try to look up force constraint equation, I don't really find a clear definition of what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So everybody got the question. So the 
let's let's test this one first. So you say you you've been able to understand what umbrella sampling is. So are because that's what you use in the practical, right? Are you guys clear about what umbrella sampling does? I think Sana had it in a lecture as no, well. No, she stopped before she could explain. Ah, it is in the book though. It's kind of vague. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> let's do that one first. Then. How much time do we have? So, I'll, I'll first try to sketch the problem, right? So, yeah. <coughs> I still want to use this board because that's going to actually be a um, So let me first sketch the problem. Let's say um, we we want to. It doesn't really depend on what kind of process we're looking at. It could be protein interaction, could be protein folding. But let's look, let's say we're looking at a particular system with a free energy. Sorry about that. With a free energy profile that's a little bit like this, right? Now, the problem we have with simulations, and that's true both for Monte Carlo and MD, uh, is that uh, that it will be, if you start in one of these minima, so, okay, sorry, let's finish it. This is free energy, and this is your reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate is, is an abstract term that just means it's some parameter that allows you to make a distinction between the states that you're interested in. Yeah? So if you're, talk, if you're looking at protein folding, it could be the number of hydrogen bonds, uh, it could be RMSD, RMSD2 native, um, or something like that. If it's protein interaction, it would be distance, makes sense, close, they, they, they're interacting, far away they cannot be interacting. Yeah? So this is, um, I'll just call it R, yeah? for reaction coordinate, it could be R for distance. Um, Let's say we start our simulation in this state. The problem is that we have, in, in most cases, the, the, the systems that we're interested in, the sampling will be, uh, sampling meaning uh, the, the generation of an, uh, like a significantly different information from where we start, uh, will be so expensive that we, we can't wait for it to cross this barrier. Right? Why do we know what? So from the theory that we presented in the course, how do we know that crossing this barrier will be a rare event? There's a formula that we have for that. Probability will be fair enough to each. Yeah. Go ahead. This is e to the power of minus delta e divided by. Yes. So it's the exponent of something with delta the difference in, in the free energy, right? I'm, I'm using F for free energy here now. Um, strictly speaking, it skips free energy, so it should be two. Uh, over KT. And the minus of it, right? So that means the bigger this energy difference, so we're talking about this energy difference, the bigger this free energy difference, the, large, the smaller the chance of being there. Yeah? Um, that's why I drew this one relatively high. For protein interactions, it's not so high. There's a different, there are different issues there. Um, so, we, in principle, we can wait for this transition to happen. But you've seen the examples for the small peptide. It happens once every 10 to 15 nanoseconds or so. You've seen the example for the small protein, where it happens every few hundred. Uh, nanoseconds, every let's say tenth of a microsecond, uh, or was it even slower? Oh, no, that whole simulation was a millisecond. So it happens every 10 to 50 microseconds. Yes. So that's that's what I call a rare event. Yeah, it happens every a few times in a millisecond. That's for a small protein. For for a slightly bigger protein, this will be even slower. Uh, so in principle, you can wait for it. In an experiment, it's easy. It's, it's seconds. You can wait a second in, in an experiment. But in a simulation, you can't wait for it. You can also start your simulation here. But then you have the same problem. Right? Because it might, it might take literally forever for the simulation to go over the barrier. 
And even if it does once, you don't have statistics. What you want is statistics. So the both methods are aimed at solving this problem. How do you make sure that your simulation samples uh, enough of this transition so you can, can get statistics? Right? Now, then there's two ways to do it. One is you fix your reaction coordinate at a certain distance. That's the constraint force approach. And the other one is you <coughs> encourage your system to be in a certain region by adding um, an umbrella potential. I'm not sure where I should, I would ideally draw it with a different color chart, but I don't think that. Uh, but there's a better figure in the book. Uh, so you would add a harmonic potential, and you remember the uh, bonded interactions that I explained uh, the other week, where you say you have your R now is really important, you have your R0, and your uh, your potential energy is something that is a, K, a, a force constant times your actual reaction coordinate minus the reference value squared. Okay? So if you just if you're going away from where you want to be, you're incurring uh, an energy penalty. And that means in your MD simulation, uh, you will have a force <coughs> that pushes the system back if it goes away too far from the surface. Yeah, so that's the umbrella. <coughs> in Monte Carlo, you can also use this to bias your sampling. You can, but you can also make it simpler because you don't have to apply to uh, all the physics rules. You can just say, uh, you can't go below this or that value of your reaction form. Yeah. That's, uh, that's also sometimes done, but it's only, only allowed in Monte Carlo. Okay. So far, so good? Is it then in Monte Carlo similar to the constraint force? No. It's a different approach. You could, because now you restrict your sampling. You say it can't be lower than this, it can't be... If you would do that... So in, in, in MD simulations, you have to go by Newton's laws. And that means if you have a fixed wall, to avoid the system from crossing that wall, you need an infinite force. <coughs> that doesn't work. Because the, the wall is infinitely sharp. So you, you, can do, you can do a very steep umbrella, which almost has the same effect. Yeah, but... Um, to restrict the sampling to a narrow region, you can make your umbrella steeper, make it a higher portion. Yeah? So now you do this for different distances, and that's the same between both approaches. So these lines, they're meant to de depict the constraint value of your reaction coordinate. So different values of R0. Yeah? And uh, the trick you do there is to, to keep your system at this distance in an MD simulation, you need to apply a force because all the atoms are moving. So let's say you have your two proteins interacting. Uh, maybe they're at the distance where they attract each other. So each time that, you, that your simulation runs, they will try to move closer. So after each integration step, you, you just add a small force that pushes them back out again. Yeah. Before you update your coordinates, you add a force that actually um, counteracts the, the intrinsic int uh, attraction that these two proteins have at that distance. At a larger distance, well, no, let's make it easy. At a smaller distance, that might actually uh, be, you might actually be pushing them uh, into each other, so they would repel each other, moving to a larger distance all the time. Then you add a force pushing them back to the distance, that, the exact distance that you want. That's cool. That's the constraint force. So the, the thing is to realize now that for each of these distances, you're actually, you can record the force that you need at that distance. And this will be a different force at each distance. Yes, so you'll get a, an average force as a function of your distance. I used to have slides on this, I don't remember, I don't remember where they went. We kicked out one lecture a couple of years ago, so maybe. Um, and you know what, you know, 
the you know the de you remember the classical physical definition of work. If you're pulling something, the amount of work you do from moving it from, let's say, I, I move this table one meter, this 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 way, <coughs> the work I have to do is the uh, the distance that I pull it times the force that I have to pull it by. Yes. Force and distance. Right. So we have now force at different distances. So we get something like. So here you get the force pointing outwards, positive force. Okay, so we have the force, free energy, and then we have the force here. Okay, so there will be positive force here, uh, almost zero, zero, negative force. Because here it will be the other way. Right? Maybe I have the sign wrong, but yeah. And then it goes uh, up to here, to zero again, just positive, and then it goes, yes? Now you can, from this state to that state, you do what to get the, f the free energy? You have, a, you have a function here of, you integrate. So the total, the total free energy between this state and that state is the area under the curve, force time distance. But that's constraint force, so constraint force integration. Yeah? OK. So that's easy to explain. That's what we use in the paper. Umbrella sampling is, uh, is uh, the problem with that is that you don't sample the intermediate values of your of your reaction coordinates. You only sample the ones that you set. So you're assuming that this is linear, yeah? which might or not might be a good assumption. Uh, but it could it could go like this. Yeah? You don't know. Uh, you avoid that by doing your brow sampling because then you basically <coughs> you're sampling multiple distances and you you're having you have multiple umbrellas. <coughs> and for each umbrella you gather statistics. So you get a histogram. So you get a histogram. I'm, I'm just gonna draw like a normal normal distribution for each histogram, right? For each umbrella, you'll get a histogram telling you the statistics of, of the distribution of distances that you find within each of these umbrellas. Statistics. There was something with statistics and free energy. If you know the probability, you can estimate the, the difference in free energy. Right? So you do that within one umbrella, accounting for the fact that you've added the umbrella, that changes your probability, but you can correct for that because you know exactly the umbrella that you put in. Because what, you, what do you expect for an umbrella like this? What distribution would you get if there's no underlying <coughs> preference? Would be close to R0. Yeah, close to R0. Yeah. Yes, but what distribution around those area do you get? A normal. Why? Because it's a quadratic potential. So you get some exponent of the square of your distance. e to the power x squared, anyone? Minus x squared. That's the Gaussian curve, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a normal distribution. Okay. That might be one of the questions. <laughs> so you know that. If you so anything that you see different here is due to the underlying free energy potential. Okay, so you take the difference of those, 
can do that either at the level of the potential or at the level of the probability, it doesn't really matter as long as you know what you're doing. And basically this, if, if the, uh, okay, so let's say you, this, is your, this is your potential, right, you. This is your Gaussian probability that you expect, like something like a normal, normal distribution, right, which is the power minus x squared. And maybe you, your observed distribution is like this. So what do you know? What is then your underlying probability? It's this difference, right? Yeah, so your, your free energy, local, is that the free energy here is lower, and there it's higher. Because otherwise it wouldn't go to lower distances. Yeah. So you can actually do this exact, and you can get a free energy, a local free energy curve. So if you go from this, you can do something like, uh, maybe this, is, this one would be this, that one would, be, would look like that, this one would look like that. And then you can stitch that together, because you know that the actual free energy in this range should be the same between the two. So you can sort of patch them together. Right? This is called <laughs> weighted histogram analysis method. These are your histograms. Yes? And the <coughs> catching these overlapping parts together is basically assigning the weight to the different histograms. The weight is actually the free energy difference between this area and that area. Because the energy, the weight, is a difference in probability, is related to a difference in free energy. Right? So, weighted history analysis method is basically stitching together these different local free energy curves so they match up and, and make one. So, on the bottom right, you said um, like the left peak was yeah. um, because of lower free energy, I would say there's a higher free energy, right? Because so if they get less favorable, or why are they? If, if, you, if you would observe this one, the, the, just the normal one, yeah. then, then your free energy would be flat, right? Mm. Yes. Yeah. But now, instead of observing this one, we have one where the probability for the lower distances, small distances, is higher. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, it yeah. likes to be here, uh, even though the, pro the uh, ground potential is already going up. Yeah. Right, so if the probability here is higher than you expect, high probability means lower free energy. Yeah. Yeah? And here the probability is lower than you expect, so the free energy there must be higher. There must be something keeping it away from here, pushing it there. Yeah? And so that's how you probe the underlying preference <coughs> of your system for different distances in, in case of the protein. Mm -hmm. A protein interaction. Okay, it's on the video. So. Was I anyway? Um, any other questions about this? There's two and a half minutes left. What's on the, on the x axis of the lamp? Which one? Uh, the lamp. The histogram. This one? Yeah. <coughs> uh, free energy. Yeah. This. This is probability. Yeah. This. Yeah. This is your reaction coordinate. Reaction. Okay. Same as this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Distance, if you're talking about protein interactions. And this one, this plot, <coughs> that's that's free energy. Or uh, delta G actually. And the same here. So this is uh, Energy, this is probability, and this is uh, the energy. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the, because you have to do a simulation for each distance. Uh, 
and so the Jews have to do more and more. more, and more, more, and more, and more. Yeah, the team has a team here, actually. Right. Yeah. 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 Y